Many are talking about red heifers and the possibility of a new temple arriving. Many are looking into the skies at eclipses. But could we be completely missing something that God is doing regarding his temple? Make no mistake, we should look for the signs of the times changing, but never at the cost of understanding the time we're living in right now. What if I told you that God's temple is more real and more relevant in your life than most realize? And what if from the four corners of the world, his spirit is putting things in place to rebuild his temple? And what if rebuilding his temple, his true temple begins with you? Let's get right into it. In a recent speech, a Hamas spokesman blamed the Jews for bringing red cows to the Holy Land. Understandably, many are looking for the temple here or there because they think to themselves, when the temple comes, the kingdom of God comes. And they think this because, well, it is true that the rebuilding of the temple physically is a part of prophecy that is to be fulfilled in relation to the second coming. For it is written in Matthew 24 that the abomination of desolation will be set up in the temple and that will be a sign of the coming great tribulation, which will be prior to the coming of Christ, that coming that we all look forward to. But could it be that we're actually losing focus on what he called us to focus on most? I want to remind you of the prophet Haggai and his prophecies regarding the temple, because in his day, the temple laid in ruin and many of the same controversies regarding its rebuilding existed in his day as it exists today. And I want to submit that many of the very same things that God was speaking through the prophet Haggai in his day, the father is speaking now. Haggai 1 verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lays in ruins? Now, therefore, thus is the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And then he gives certain signs of things that's happening in their day. And he says, you have sown much and you have harvested little. You eat but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Thus is the Lord of hosts. Consider your ways. I want to submit to you that what we just read, it should resonate with some of us. As it was in the days of Haggai, so it is today. The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord is what many are saying. And we build our paneled houses while his house lies in ruin. And when we look around us, is it not true that we're working harder than ever before, making less than ever before? It's like we put our money in our pockets, but it's like there are holes in our very pockets. It is like we harvest, but What do we get for that harvest? We see economic downturns all around the world right now. And no matter where you are in the world, every single country is facing that pressure right now. And you may say, well, PD, hasn't that happened before? Let those who have ears hear. In the Exodus, the Israelites were also facing many pressures as they came out. They had little. They didn't have food. They didn't have water. They were in a wilderness. And in that lack, as they faced their pressures, it was there with purpose. It was there to point them to the Lord, for them to inquire of the Lord, to think to themselves, 
what may please our Lord? And God drew them into that place, into the wilderness, in order to call for a tabernacle to be built. For Israel to build a place, a tabernacle that would be something that facilitates the presence of God, his spirit to be in the camp and for them to be able to approach God through what we now know as the Levitical system. Through offerings and gifts and through many protocols that were very precise and Now, if you think about that, God bringing them out of the wilderness was for him to be with them in them, pleasing the Lord through building this tabernacle. It was in that that they had their fill. It was in that that they were most satisfied, that their thirst was quenched and their hungers were satisfied. See, they thought that they were hungry and thirsty and that having more water come from a rock or having more you know, manna from heaven, that these were going to be the things that will be their fill. But Yeshua comes and says, I am the water from the rock. I am the manna from heaven. I am your satisfaction and you feeling like you have a need right now. You feeling like you work and and you're there's nothing coming from your labors right now. It's all with purpose for you to ask and inquire of the Lord. What will please my Lord? And you know what pleases him? The same thing that always have pleased him to be with you in the garden to be with his people, to tabernacle among them. And so now you might ask, so PD, what are you talking about? What are you calling for us to build a temple like Haggai, the prophet called for Israel to rebuild a temple? Let me reveal to you the temple that the Lord is revealing to you, not a temple made with hands, but the temple of this age. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is the prophetic utterance that we now see through Paul, where Haggai talked about the rebuilding of the physical temple. And Paul is speaking of the temple that was bought with a price that is you as you must glorify God with your temple, with your body. And and you see, you know, many of us, we've known this even since kindergarten. We've heard, oh, you're a temple of God. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. We've heard this million times before we and it's kind of this become this cute little thing, this symbolic idea, this pie in the sky. It sounds so good, but what does it mean? See, it's not just symbolic. And this is what we have missed, brothers and sisters. And because we have missed what I'm about to tell you, we have caused the temple of God to lay in ruin. We have not rebuilt it. It has gone to waste. And it is the very thing that has been bought with a price. Yet it has gone to waste in our midst. And the Lord is saying no more. I am calling forth the rebuilding of a temple. Yeshua said, it is good that I ascend and leave you. See, when he died, he could have just established his kingdom in all the ways that we would have expected, basically bringing an end to all of the wicked kings and kingdoms of this world, establishing his and ruling on earth forevermore. But yet he said, I'm going to go because if I do not go, The Holy Spirit cannot come to you. Him leaving is for the Holy Spirit to come in and dwell this temple. See, before there was this Levitical temple, which was a copy of what was in heaven. And that is beautiful. It is given by God, that which was on earth, that Levitical temple and that Levitical system. But then we see that the temple who is Yeshua, who is Christ, comes into this world and we see that the Holy Spirit comes upon him like a dove, fills him 
and empowers him like no rabbi or anyone who's come before has been empowered. No prophet, no one else has been empowered as he has. There's something about him and the temple that he is, the the spirit that is indwelling him that makes everyone look and see and taste that our father is good. As he says, I have come to do nothing but what I see my father do. And then as he is raised upon the cross and breathes his last breath, it is written that in that moment, the veil of that Levitical temple is torn. And as it is torn, everything changes. Everything changes because we have now been cleansed by the blood of the Messiah and we are now white as snow. The Holy Spirit can come and descend upon believers and enter them, their temples, rebuilding the temple that the Messiah was ushering in in his day. Remember what he said? Break down this temple, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. He was talking about his body and then he ascended and say, I'm ascending in order to raise up, to build a temple on earth in my people for my people to become that. But do not become ignorant. The enemy, Satan, just as he had a plan in the temples that have been built before, hoping to corrupt them. So he has and been attempting to corrupt the temple that Christ established in his people. See, in the first century, he religious hypocrisy abounded and people were, who were the religious leaders, especially were taking advantage of God's temple. And that was the very thing that led to its downfall and destruction. They were using it for their own benefit. And what if that is to serve as a warning to us that Satan would also want to do the same thing with the temple that came thereafter? See, I want to submit to you that indeed for 2000 years, ever since then, God's people have been pacified by false religion, by traditions of men that have abandoned the temple of our God, abandoned the priestly duties that he has called us to and the offerings that the early church was so well known by. See, God is rebuilding it. He's resurrecting dry bones and he's raising the temple as he has always desired. But many are crying out. It is not yet the time for the house of the Lord. It is not yet the time for the Holy Spirit to move. See, there is coming a time we say we there is coming a time we say where the Holy Spirit will move powerfully through his people with great signs and wonders and miracles as he moved through Moses, as he moved through Yeshua, Jesus himself, as he moved through the disciples. We say it is not yet time. Maybe one day that will happen. Maybe in the the end of the end of the end of the last days that will happen. But I want to prophesy to you just as Haggai said, so it is. Many are saying the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. I say to you, the time of the Holy Spirit is now. As Peter prophesied in Acts chapter two, in the last days, it will be I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh to prophesy. And so I declare to you, the Lord is saying, I am pouring out my spirit upon all flesh now in this moment today. If you can hear me, you are living in the day for it. And the question is, is will you rebuild the house of the Lord in your life or will you allow it to remain laid in ruins because the spirit is quenched in you and in your fellowship and in your city and in your country? Or will you become the very thing that becomes change because the temple of God is a temple that is bringing change? See, God, whenever he called for the temple to be rebuilt, it marked a moment of change for all of his people. 
They would start worshiping him like never before. They would start becoming a witness like never before. In fact, many people from all over the world, by the time that Yeshua, that Jesus was walking, many people from all over the world were coming from the four corners to the temple. See, the temple is the place, the thing that draws people to the presence. And so now what if that's what you're called to be now? Luke 17, 22, and he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the son of man and you will not see it. See, Yeshua is speaking to his disciples and he's saying, look, there's going to come a time when you guys and believers, they're going to desire to see the coming. They're going to look for the signs. They're going to go and look for the signs in the skies. They're going to go and look for the signs that Yeshua said we should look for, like the rebuilding of a temple as a sign that his coming is drawing more near for the signs upon the earth with wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places and and all of these things, which let me clarify. Absolutely, we should be looking for the signs that he has said we should look for. We should remain aware awake. But he says there's going to come a time when you're going to look to to desire those days to see the son of man coming. But you will not see it. See, we are in those days right now where we are desiring it and we're not seeing it right now yet. We're not seeing his coming yet. He is coming, but it is not yet. But This is why I want to submit to you. He told his disciples that this he was warning them because in where we are today, it's easy to grow impatient about his prophesied coming. And in our impatience, we start grasping for anything that can bring hope for his coming because we feel like this world is growing darker. We feel like we want to escape this place. But I want to submit that the war that Messiah is warning us against losing focus. Yes, you may not see my coming yet, but do not lose focus on what I told you to look to most. And let me say, yes, he told us to look for the signs, but there is a focus, a calling he's placed right in front of us that many of you are losing focus on as you incline your eyes on everything else but that. And the second warning is to become careless about the signs and the prophecies that he is giving us. See, he has given us true signs in heaven and on earth indeed. But as we grow more hungry for his return, we start grasping for things that aren't actually signs. And we start looking to prophecies that that aren't actually prophecies of the Lord. We must be careful to when we consider the signs, to consider it according to what is written and spoken by the Messiah himself, not inflating things, considering all things indeed, but not inflating and not inflating prophecies or making or speaking prophecies forth because we hope for those prophecies to come to pass so much. But just because you hope for something doesn't mean that that's the will of the Lord. And many of us are hoping so much that he must return in my lifetime. I'm getting old. PD, my time is drawing near. He has to return in my lifetime. And so now we are grasping for his return so much that we are compromising the truth of what it means we should be looking for. And so I want to submit to you, the more we lose focus on what we are to focus on, the more careless with the signs we become. And like children who have nothing to do but stare into the sky, we find ourselves like believers with nothing to do, it seems, but stare at signs. And again, signs are given to us, but we have more to do than stare at signs. And so now we see Christians all over the world who are but cultural Christians. They're suddenly very interested in his return with an eclipse that's occurring or with a red heifer that's discovered. And everyone is excited. But I want to ask you this. 
Where is the excitement of the sign that we are to become? Where is the excitement for the building of the temple of the Lord? The temple he's building you up to be. Where is the excitement in believers to be changed by the Holy Spirit, empowered from up high, for to see the manifestations that God wants to move through you as he moved through the Messiah, as he prophesied, as he had words of knowledge, as he had many healings bring forth, as he had the demons cast out all around him, as the early church turned cities upside down with the very fact that they recognized themselves to be the temple that has come. I would like to remind you of the moment that the disciples witnessed the ascension of Yeshua. And the angel came to them in Acts 1.11 and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go. We see that the disciples were so astonished at his leaving, perhaps as they even proclaim themselves being saddened by his ascension and leaving of them. They were perhaps looking into the sky with the sadness of when are you going to come back? And that is understandable. Many of us are, are looking into the skies with that sadness of when are you coming back? And the Messiah rejoices in our hearts of hoping for his return. Hallelujah. But I want to remind you of what happens just about two or three or four verses later in this very chapter of Acts 1. It is in verse 13 written, and when they had entered, they went to the upper room. And we know, all of us know what happens in Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit is poured out upon everyone there. And we see that 3,000 are baptized instead of the 3,000 that perished before at the building of the golden calf. And so we witness now, in fact, the very thing that the Father wants to do. He wants us to recognize, yes, he has ascended and he will come the way that he is coming. He has left. However, at the same time, he wants us to now and go to the upper room. He wants us to go to the places that he has called us to, where the Holy Spirit can move in and through us. See, if the disciples camped under the stars, looking into the heavens, looking at the skies, looking for the signs of his return, and that's all they ever did, they would not accomplish any of what they did. But see, the angel told him, what are you looking at? He's going to come back. As to tell them, get busy with what he has called you. In the first century, they had a temple physically standing. They had their red heifers and all of the things that they felt they needed. However, their offerings, despite everything they were doing, were still unclean because they were a people who became distracted and it caused that very temple, that second temple to become destroyed, just as the Messiah prophesied would happen. Offerings for them, it wasn't actually just bringing a guilt offering or bringing a sin offering forth or or whatever offering following the Levitical protocols as God did outline, which was wonderful. However, their offerings that they offer became unclean because of their evil works. And this is what Haggai warned in verse 14. So it is with this people. And with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. The work of our hands is our offering unto the Lord. And because the work of their hands was full of hypocrisies and uncleanness, suddenly they became corrupted themselves. And with that, their expectations of who the Messiah is and what he's going to look like became corrupted and they could not recognize him walking among them. They could not recognize the true temple of God walking among them. But if they were imitating their God, 
in the ways that he's always called and desires, desired, even ever since the garden, then perhaps then they would have recognized him walking among them. The rest of this teaching I would like to spend with you speaking about what is the temple that God is calling us to become built up as? What are the offerings that he is calling us to offer? As Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 5, that we are building up a spiritual house. We are also a holy priesthood and we offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through our Messiah, Jesus Christ. So it all begins with God calling his priests, his priesthood together for us to be retrained to be the priesthood that he called us to be and to offer the correct sacrifices he called us to offer. For us to understand what those sacrifices are, it is good for us to look at the Levitical offerings outlined in Leviticus chapter six, because understanding them more helps us understand the offerings we today can offer. The first one I would like to speak about is Leviticus 6, 9, the burnt offering. God explains the burnt offering as having a fire that shall be kept burning on the altar continually. And he says it shall not go out. Now, if you think about our altars of our temples and the fire that is to be burning continuously. We know that the fire is the Holy Spirit. See, God provides the fire. He provides us the the empowerment, the drive, the the thing that keeps us warm and keeps us going in our faith. And the thing that allows us to burn our sacrifices on the fire. So the Holy Spirit is seeking us to keep our fire going. How is a fire kept going? Well, just as the priests had to go and take wood every day and make sure to put it on the fire to keep the fire going. So we have to continue to place wood on our fires to keep it going. The wood is laid by our obedience. It is something that we need to do on our end to gather wood is to go out, to cut it down, to carry it and to lay it on the fire. Any relationship requires work. And that does not mean we are safe by works. We are safe by faith. But our relationship with God requires us to bring our side. It means that we should come to him drawing near in prayers and fastings in reading of the scriptures in prayers, in obedience to whatever he is calling us to do, fulfilling his commandments in our life, fulfilling the Great Commission in our life, whatever that is, that step is us bringing our wood to the table, stepping forth and and then letting the Holy Spirit burn it. Letting the Holy Spirit burn in us, letting the Holy Spirit empower us in every one of those works. See, we, the wood in of itself does nothing. Wood in of itself just lays there. But wood that touches the fire ignites. And so our obedience ignites into something greater. So we may feel weak. We may feel like we cannot do much. But when our wood touches the fire, the little wood that we gather touches the fire, suddenly it ignites. And it burns, it burns, it burns, becomes something that many people are drawn to. And many people see our sacrifices and they see and taste that the Lord is good, that he has saved us for a moment like this to become a living sacrifice. I want to remind you of the story of Elijah, who Elijah, he had to do all the work of bringing the wood and he packed it all up and he even came and he brought um, uh, uh, water and he poured water all over this wooden altar and and it, he made it really difficult for this fire to start of this sacrifice. But see, is that water that he poured out on the altar was a demonstration of his great faith that even despite pouring water all over this altar, 
it's still going to ignite because nothing will stop the Holy Spirit. And so I want to challenge you that in your life, pour water over your altar, pour water over your wood, believe for the greater things that this this what I'm about to do right now, where I'm about to step right now. I've gathered the wood, but not, I've not only just gathered the wood, which is like the minimum. I have even gone to take water now and pour it out on this wood. I have gone in great faith and said, this is who my God is. He can split the seas. He can walk on water and he can even ignite wood that is drenched in water. And so the prophets of Baal stand no chance when they see who our God is. What he asks of us on our burnt offering is a valuable sacrifice. I want you to think about what are you offering to the Lord in your life that is of value to you? He has made great offerings, the most valuable of all offerings in giving us his son. And that is what Passover is all about. And Passover is on the horizon. He has given us that great offering. What are you going to bring to the table? What are you going to offer him in your life? What is there that you so cherish that he is saying, I want you to give that to me. Ask of the Lord and be obedient to what he is calling. Yeshua, the Messiah is the perfect burnt offering our perfect example of what it looks like to walk as a living sacrifice. The next one I would like to speak about is the grain offering of Leviticus 6 verse 14. And I want to submit to you that when we look at this grain offering, the scriptures talk about various ingredients that is in in this. We see that there's this flour mixed with oil and frankincense and that it is all unleavened. I want to submit that these are all ingredients for a fruitful life. First, we have the flower. The flower is like the base. It is the truth, the foundation. Then we have the oil, which is the Holy Spirit that is mixed with the flower. And then we have the frankincense. And I want to submit to you the frankincense is as one of the ingredients of the incense that goes up to the Lord. The frankincense represents our prayers. And all of these things being unleavened. Speaking of our intentions, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven of malice and evil, but unleavened with sincerity and truth. See, sincerity is our unleavenedness, and that is to have an intention in our hearts of being sincere. That is who our Messiah is. He is the perfect grain offering, full of spirit, full of truth, full full of prayer and intentions that is full of sincerity. Next up is the sin offering of Leviticus 6 verse 25. The sin offering is interesting because whatever touches that offering becomes holy. That which is most holy is the Messiah himself. And at Passover, he told his disciples, you must eat of me. Otherwise, you will have no part in me. We must eat of his body in order for us to be clean, to be made holy. And so he becoming the perfect sin offering for us calls us to become holy as he is holy by partaking in him. In other words, not by trusting in our own works, but by trusting in his work on the cross and in his perfect life that is indestructible, that sin could never have a hold on and which death could never rule over. See, our sin offering is our great faith in the finished work of the cross itself. The next offering is the guilt offering of Leviticus 7 verse 1. I want to submit to you that it is all in the name of the offering guilt. Even if we have sinned and we are cleansed of our sins, guilt and shame can still remain on our conscience. 
Even if you know you've been forgiven of something you may have done before, you may still feel guilty and ashamed in your conscience of what you have done. And even what has been done against you, many people who have had sins done against them, who've been abused, they feel guilty and they feel ashamed because of what they've suffered. And this is the offering that rids us of guilt and rids us of shame. And the Messiah himself is that offering. He not only made us white as snow, but he comes to clean our conscience of guilt and shame. Just as Adam and Eve were in the garden and as they themselves sinned and suddenly felt naked and ashamed. That's what we go through. But what God comes and he says for us to do is take the blood of this offering, throw it against the sides of the altar. And so I want to submit to you that he comes to our altars of our temples and he cleanses it of all guilt and all shame in order for us to be able to from there on out have sacrifices, living sacrifices in our life that are not contaminated with guilt and shame, because shame and guilt is something that wants to contaminate everything else in our life. Everything else we set out to do, everything we set out to see, the lens by which we see the world how we treat other people. If we live in guilt and shame and condemnation, our relationship with people and God is most affected. But he is saying, I died even for you to no longer live in guilt and shame. I died for your conscience to be cleansed. Hebrews 9 14 says, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hallelujah. The next offering I'd like to speak about is the peace offering of Leviticus 7 verse 11, which consists of loaves of leavened bread and is described to be a gift to God but then belongs to the priest for his consumption. Now, I want to submit that is how it is with peace. God desires us to have peace and walk in peace. Our peace is something that he cherishes. It is a gift to God, but it is something that we partake in as the priests. It belongs to us at the same time. Think about it this way. Yeshua speaks and he says, before you go and make an offering to God, consider whether you have a brother or at odds with you. And if so, go and make things right with that brother and then bring your gift to the altar. This is part of it. God desires us to be at peace with our brothers and sisters, and that is our gift to God. But It also then belongs to us because as we forgive our brothers and our sisters, he says, God forgives us. And if we do not forgive them, God will not forgive us. Therefore, we get to partake in the forgiveness of Christ in our forgiveness of others and treatment of others. He makes specific technical delineations on when it may be eaten. And he says it has to be eaten on the day that it is offered and not left until the next morning. But he says that if the offering is done out of a vow or out of free will, then you may eat of it the next day. Now consider this for a moment. Why? Does he say this about this peace offering? We should forgive quickly as he has forgiven us quickly on the day, if you will. But if we make a vow, for example, if we say that we will make things right with our brother, we haven't yet, but that is what we are going to do. God allows us to take time unto the second day before we can partake in that peace. Or if we have a free will offering, in other words, we desire to go above and beyond what is commanded, but out of our free will, we pursue peace 
in ways of going above and beyond. That means, like Yeshua said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, turn the other cheek. You've heard it said, but I say to you, walk further with someone. He is calling us to go further than the minimum requirements out of our own free will, our own desire, our own love for God and our neighbor. And in that, he permits us to partake in that peace that comes from that kind of an offering unto the second day, if you will. But he says, no matter what, you cannot eat of that offering on the third day. It is not allowed. He says in verse 17, what remains on the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burned up with fire. Why is this? I want to submit to you, spiritually speaking, that the third day represents the day of the resurrection. Christ was in the earth and he was raised on the third day. And so he has promised that we all will be raised again. The resurrection that awaits us all is going to come. And when it does, the time is up to forgive. The time is up to make peace. The time is up to restore. See, God is in this life going to look upon our lives and he is going to see whether we made peace offerings. He is going to see whether we forgave our brothers and sisters. And that is going to determine how he looks at us when we stand before him, because did we fulfill our end? of the forgiveness we were to walk out in light of the forgiveness he has given us through his death. It's going to be too late to pick up the phone after the resurrection to make peace with your father. It's going to be too late to call your son or daughter or your brother or your sister at church who you have odds with. Call, reach out, make things right before it is the third day. And you will be the one who benefits from eating of that offering. And that will be a great gift to your Lord that pleases him. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. In being peacemakers, it reinforces our identity as sons, and it allows us to start operating out of that identity as sons which comes with the authority that the Holy Spirit brings for us to walk in the power of the Spirit as the Messiah did. But we have to be peacemakers as he was a peacemaker. Why does it help that you try and you pursue signs and wonders and miracles and and people coming to faith and people repenting all around you, all these wonderful things, but yet you have a life full of chaos with others? instead of peace. What does it even help that we say that we are a people who keep the Sabbath day, the day of peace, the day of the Prince of Peace, but we are not a temple of peace. All of our boastings of keeping a Sabbath day means nothing if we do not actually walk it out in our lives. And you may say, well, Petey, it is so difficult to love and to be in peace with others sometimes. I want to remind you about who our brothers and sisters in the faith actually are and what they are. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. When we start seeing fellow believers as temples of God, that changes everything. Because the temple of God is something we have reverence for. It's something we 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 consider holy. We consider something that it is where the spirit of the Lord dwells. And if we can start seeing one another for the actual temple, not just like symbolically, but actually the place where the spirit of God dwells, even more real than the copy that was on earth, the actual place where the spirit dwells, Perhaps then that will change the way we treat fellow brothers and sisters with more reverence. See, brothers and sisters, we have to be perfectly justified in our treatment of others when they are temples of the Holy Spirit, especially if we are treating them poorly 
we should fear and be careful that we stand justified before God, not moving out of assumptions, not moving out of our flesh, but having reverence for the vessel that God has chosen to indwell and use. Even if you may say, I wouldn't have chosen that vessel and I wouldn't have used that vessel. You are not God. He is. And he therefore uses people that you may not expect. And that is the pattern of scripture. Therefore, let us stand in fear, lest we come against and destroy the temple of God. So become an offering of peace. Offer up your guilt and shame to the Messiah as he died for you to be free. Offer up your sin and that which keeps you in bondage and let the Messiah touch you so that you would become holy. Offer up your burnt offerings, that which is most precious to you, that offering he calls you to burn up in your life and offer up your grain offering, the ingredients of spirit and truth become a living sacrifice, walking it out with good, sincere intentions at all times. And then you will see that the garden becomes restored all around you. What is inside of you starts changing the world outside of you. And then it will be that they won't say, look, here it is or look there. But they will recognize that the kingdom of God is within you. Perhaps then all of the lack that we witness in our lives will be turned to prosperity. As Haggai concluded in Haggai 2.19, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you because you have inclined your eyes to the temple that I would like to establish in you. So let us no longer say the time is not yet. The time is now. Let's become it. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that you would come with your spirit and indwell every temple listening to this and you would come and make our our offerings clean. Father, remove uncleanness from us, remove guilt and shame and condemnation from us, remove, remove all of the the distraughts and disunities from our hearts that we have with one another, Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would come and help us to become a temple of spirit and truth, a grain offering worthy of your spirit. Father, help us to be a people that is seen and becomes known for the love because to love the Lord of all of our heart, mind, soul and strength and our neighbor and as ourself is more than all burnt offering and sacrifices. Lord, help us to a love above all. We thank you. We praise you. Yeshua, bring about a great move. Bring your people into alignment with you. Let them see and taste that you are good. I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you for joining me. Subscribe and like this video and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.